Okay, well, a screen recording it is for the rest of lecture. I will be sure to stock up on batteries for next time. Uh, let's see, where are we at? Uh, so I was saying that you can go from the first structure to the last structure, and you, you will see people do that on occasion, and there's nothing wrong with it. So the way that you would do that is if I do that first arrow in the same way, but instead of landing the pi bond on the carbon, I just move it over here. That would be a pi bond to pi bond move. Then I could break this pi bond, and I would get directly from that first resonance structure to that last resonance structure. There's nothing wrong with that. However, I recommend that you don't do it because if I'm asking you for all the resonance structures of a compound, I find that people go from one to three, they can't figure out how to arrive at that resonance structure in the middle. So what I like to do is push electrons um, as little as possible, as little as possible as I can to get to a resonance structure and kind of do things stepwise. So there's nothing wrong with going from this first one to this last one with those two moves. Um, and I can go from the last one back to the middle one. There's a way to do that with the arrow pushing. My only recommendation for not doing that is oftentimes it's really difficult to find that remaining resonance structure if you don't take it stepwise and kind of go one at a time. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with doing that. Okay, so let's look at the positively charged structure now. With the positively charged structure, we want to think about how can I move electrons towards the positive charge. So when I have a negatively charged structure, I want to look for where that negative charge is and see if I can push that outward from the negative charge and share it with other atoms. Now I have a positive charge, I want to think about moving electrons toward that positive charge. So if I look at this middle structure, what I see sitting next door is a pi bond. So I can take this pi bond and move it over here. So I'm going from pi bond to pi bond. That's that third move that I had up there. So let's take a look at what the charges are going to look like afterwards and what the structure will look like. Okay, so the carbon that was originally positively charged, what's the charge on it now? Neutral. Neutral. And the carbon right here, what's its charge? Yeah, so this will be positive one. So that's going to have a plus charge because I'm basically just moving the pi electrons over and I'm moving that plus charge from one position to another. But notice my arrow doesn't start on the plus charge. It doesn't show explicitly where the plus charge moves. We show where the electrons move, and that formal charge naturally changes when we move those electrons in the way that we did. Okay, so can we, do we have any other electrons we could move into that positive charge? Yeah, we've got a lone pair on the oxygen, yep. So we want to always be thinking about pylons and lone pairs when we're thinking about resonance structures, and they need to be on that adjacent atom. In fact, I'll show you an example where um, we have a structure that wouldn't have resonance forms. So we can take the lone pair on this oxygen, use it to form a pi bond between carbon and oxygen. And now let's take a look at where those formal charges have moved. So the carbon, just like before, it was positively charged, but now it's got all four bonds. We moved a pair of electrons into it. So now it should be neutral. And what about the charge on oxygen? Mm -hmm. Plus one. Right, so oxygen went from being neutral, two lone pairs, two bonds. Now it shares one of its lone pairs, so it's going to sort of own less electrons to itself, so it's going to go to a positive charge. Okay, so that's why I think people find the charge structures, if you start off with a charge structure, that the resonance forms are a little bit easier to arrive at because you focus on moving electrons outward from a negative charge or in towards a positive charge to sort of move that charge around. Um, and the significance of that is that's more stable for the structure because instead of a single carbon atom having a full plus one charge, since we know in reality that it's a hybrid of all three of these structures, that first carbon only has a partial positive charge, and that carbon in the middle 
sort of in the middle, I guess the third carbon has a partial positive charge. And then the oxygen on the end has a partial positive charge. So no one atom has to take on that full plus one charge. Instead, they can all take on a partial amount of that positive charge and spread it out. And that's stabilizing for a molecule. Um, we are going to talk about which resonance structures are more stable than others in just a minute, and we'll assess all three of these for both cases. But now let's go to the neutral molecule. I think this is the one by far that people struggle with the most because it's neutral and it looks pretty good and you're not really sure where to go with it. Um, and you don't have a charge that you're focused on moving around. So what you want to look for here is you want to look for a polar pi bond. So what I mean by that is a pi bond that could be double or triple that's between one atom that's more electronegative than the other atom that it's pi bonded to. So I have a polar pi bond here. It's the carbon-oxygen pi bond. That's polar because oxygen is a lot more electronegative than carbon is. So the way we start off with a neutral structure is look for a polar pi bond, break the pi bond, and give the electrons to who? In this case, give them to carbon or oxygen. Why? Yeah, it's more electronegative. So if we start off with a neutral structure and we come up with a resonance form, we're going to generate charges. So we can immediately see that what we started with is almost certainly going to be a more significant resonance contributor than what I'm about to draw, because I'm now going to have to introduce two new formal charges. But if you have a polar pi bond, this still is a contributing resonance structure. It's just not nearly as contributing as the, the original one. So my oxygen went from neutral to negative because it's gaining a pair of electrons. Just to make this arrow look a little prettier, I should start right in the middle of that bond and land it on the oxygen atom. And then what's the charge on that carbon atom? Yeah, exactly, positive. So yeah, clearly we can see this, this, this structure is not as good as the first one. Just looking at it, you can tell this is the less significant resonance contributor for sure. But it still is a valid one. So if I start off with something that has a negative charge or something that has a positive charge, I don't want to introduce new charges. That won't be a significant contributor. The only significant contributors are going to be those that just move around those charges and stabilize them. But when I start off with something neutral, I have no choice really but to generate charges. It will mean that the contributor is less significant, but that's the only way we want to generate new charges out of nowhere. Otherwise, whatever you're drawing just isn't going to be as significant of a contributor. Okay. But once we do that, now we're back in a charge scenario. So now we can go back to the slightly easier version of coming up with resonance structures and say, I've got a plus charge, I've got a minus charge. Can I move them around and make them more stable? Um, can I move the negative charge? No, I mean, I can, but I can move it right back to the starting structure I got to, so there's nowhere else for it to go. So there's no additional direction I can take that one. And what about the positive charge? Are there any other electrons that could be donated into the positive charge? Yeah, that nitrogen atom. So we, we want to look around to see if attached to that positive charge, we have a pi bond or a lone pair that would have electrons that we can move in. Here we have a nitrogen lone pair. So I can take those electrons, move them in. Now, what's the charge on nitrogen? Good, good, good. Great. OK, so one thing that we want to think about doing is ranking resonance uh, structures in terms of how stable they are. Because the more stable a resonance structure is, then the more the hybrid structure will look like that, and the less it will look like the less stable resonance contributors. So, if you're looking at this, I think we can all immediately see probably, and I have a set of rules to go through why, but we can pretty clearly see that this is probably the most stable. It's got no charges. Both of the other ones have charges. Without reading what I have in the notes and just taking your best guess, which among the remaining two structures do we think might be better, the first or the second? Yeah, a lot of people's inclination is to say the first, and I know why, because carbon is more or is less electronegative than nitrogen, so wouldn't it rather have that positive charge than nitrogen? For that reason, yes. However, what's different between carbon and nitrogen when they have a plus charge? Octet. 
Yeah, the only atom that we're gonna see, other than boron, which we'll talk about later, but the only one typically we're gonna see that has an incomplete octet is a carbon atom with a plus charge. Plus charge on nitrogen has a complete octet. Plus charge on oxygen has a complete octet. It's only when that plus charge is on carbon that it has an incomplete octet. Um, so let me go through the rules for determining which is the most uh, stable resonance contributor. But remember, a complete octet is very, very important. So these are the three rules you'll go through. But you won't necessarily go through all three of them because these are ranked in order of importance. If you look at rule one and you're able to answer which resonance structure is more stable than the other based on rule one, you stop. Because you might get to rule two and it disagrees with rule one. And you might get to rule three and it disagrees with rule one. But it doesn't matter because if one is the most important rule, if one is the most stabilizing factor among the three, then you wanna ignore the other two. So if we were to just simply say which is the most stable among these three at the top, minimize formal charge, the first one is neutral, the other two have charges. Question answer, we don't care about rule three or rule, rule two or rule three. If we were ranking them all together, like in order of one, two, three, we could use rule one to say that that is the most stable resonance contributor. And then we would have to move down to rule two or three to answer which among these two, how do they rank in terms of number two or number three. So they both have equivalent formal charges. They both have one plus and one minus. So that means that rule one doesn't tell us among those two which one is better. Let's go down to number two. Filled valence shells, complete octet. Can we answer it based on that? Does one of them have a, an incomplete octet? Yes. Does, do both of them? No. no, exactly. This one in the middle, plus charge on carbon, has an incomplete octet that immediately qualifies it for number three. That makes this one number two. We now want to ignore rule three. So these one, two, three are not the rules. These are the order of stability of the resonance. So most stable and the least. For ranking those last two, we determine the answer based on that second factor up there. We need to ignore the third. If you don't ignore the third, you're probably going to end up with the wrong answer because the third says you want to put the negative charge on more electronegative atoms, positive charge on the less electronegative atoms. And that would suggest the opposite order. You would say, oh, you want the plus charge on the carbon because it's less electronegative. Um, but that's not the case because the complete octets are more important than where those charges are. So we want to ignore rule number three. There are cases where we will have to go down to rule number three. In fact, I think there's one up here. Um, but in this case, we wouldn't. OK, let's take a look at this middle set here, which is the most stable resonance contributor, the first, the second, or the third. Good, yeah, immediately the third. I see a plus charge on carbon in the first. I see a plus charge on carbon on the second. And I see a plus charge on oxygen in the third. That means rule one can't be used because they all have exactly plus one overall formal charge. So I go to rule two, and that's about complete octets. Both things with the plus charge on carbon having complete octets. So I can immediately say that this one is the most stable. As far as the remaining two, that would be tricky to rank them. So let's just stop at most stable here. Because the, technically you could rank the remaining two, but not based on the information we have right now. Okay, so then let's look at this last one. Uh, the first, second, or third resonance structure, which one is the most stable? How about which one's the least stable? Yeah, the middle one, the second one, exactly. So the outer two, they'd be pretty similar in stability. We wouldn't be able to rank those. So if we look at rule one, that's minimized formal charges. They all have a minus one charge. So we ignore that rule. We go down to number two. Complete octets. Everyone's got complete octets. So we've got to ignore rule number two. Now we're forced to go to rule number three, which says we want the negative charges or more electronegative and, and vice versa. So we see negative charge on oxygen in the first one, negative charge on carbon in the second, negative on oxygen on the third. So the two with the negative charge on oxygen are, are more stable because oxygen's more electronegative. So these two are the more stable. And the middle one is less stable. So that, again, that just means that if I were to draw a resonance hybrid, the hybrid would look 
more, there'd be more negative charge on those oxygen atoms, more partial negative charge on those than there would be on the carbon atom. Not something that would be easily <laughs> drawn out and, and indicated in any way, but just something to keep in mind. Okay, I do want to give you an example of something that wouldn't have resonance structures because I don't want to lead you to believe that everything in the world has a resonance structure. There's plenty of compounds that don't have resonance structures. So let's take a look at this one. I start off with an oxygen that has a negative charge. So I wanna think about, can I take that negative charge and move it somewhere? So what did we do in the last case when we had that negative charge? We took one of the lone pairs on oxygen and we went from lone pair to pi bond. But then we know we didn't want phi bonds to carbon, so what did we do? In that case, that carbon that was next to the oxygen was part of a pi bond, so we broke that pi bond and we landed a lone pair on the next, the next carbon over. Uh, it's right here. So when we look at this structure, we move the negative charge, or sorry, the lone pair on oxygen, moved it over to form a pi bond, and then we broke the pi bond to that carbon that it, the oxygen was attached to. I don't have that here. I've got a pi bond sitting over here, so it looks a little tempting, like there's some way to do this, but the only way I can do this is if there's a pi bond directly on this carbon to break, and there isn't. So there's nowhere I can move these electrons. There's no resonance structures I have that's gonna stabilize that charge. So that oxygen atom is gonna be stuck with the full minus one charge and it's just not gonna be spread out throughout the molecule. Everything makes sense so far? Easy, right? Now resonance structures are, um, I don't know how to say this nicely. They'll torture you throughout the rest of the 30 series. <laughs> the, the more you get used to them and get comfortable with them, it's, it's definitely gonna help you out a lot because there's gonna be time and time again that the explanation for why something happens uh, is resonance. Yeah. Um, for that molecule, how can, I know it's less stable, but how come you can't move that pi bond into a, a lone pair on the, on the carbon? So if you did something like this, Oh, like do something like that? On the other, um, the other carbon, so that has it's negative in charge. Sorry. This way? Yeah. It's less stable, but it's... Yeah, yeah. So in general, what I would say is the reason I say um, with neutral structures you look for a polar pi bond is because there's a clear direction where the arrow should go. When you have a polarized pi bond like carbon and oxygen, it's clear that you should break the pi bond and always give the electrons to the oxygen because it's more electronegative and not the carbon. So here, I could do that and then put a plus charge on this carbon and a minus on this one, but I could also move it the other way and do the opposite charges. And since they both equally suck, they would, even if they existed, they'd kind of cancel each other out, right? Because <laughs> there's no driving force for the plus charge to go on one side versus the other um, and the minus charge because, because of the fact that they're both carbon atoms. No, mm -mm. no. Because like I said, what you'd end up with, right, is one resonance structure that says this is plus and this is minus, and then another one where it's the opposite. So even if they were resonance contributors, they would literally cancel each other out and wouldn't change the resonance hybrid, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then the other thing I would say in general is if you start off with a charge, don't introduce new ones. Stick with moving around the one you have um, and not introducing new ones. Only when you start off with perfectly neutral should you break pi bonds like that. Okay. So let's see, where are we? Okay, so these were examples I, I meant to go through, but they look really similar to the ones we just did. We'll go ahead and, and do them anyway. So I'm gonna include the arrow pushing on this. Um, to get from the first resonance structure to the second, I start on the lone pair. I move it here to make a pi bond, and then I break this pi bond. And I'm sorry I keep leaving out lone pairs. We're gonna learn line angle formulas very soon where you don't have to draw lone pairs. I'd recommend it, but they're not required. 
And it is, this part of the quarter is always really hard for me because I, I can't keep, draw these full structures because I'm just not used to it. I always make that mistake. Um, okay, so we do that and we get to the structure on the right. Um, so which of these is more stable, A or B? Uh, yeah, good, B. So we can't use rule one, we can't use rule two. Um, we go to rule three and the negative charge would be more stable on oxygen, so this one. Um, this one we did a nearly identical problem above. In fact, we know we had a third resonance structure in the middle, um, but if we were just comparing these two, which is more stable? Right, yeah, we can use rule number one. And then this question down here says, what about other possible resonance structures for uh, this compound above? That's what we did here in the top structure. It was basically that middle structure. So I don't want to rehash it for a nearly identical structure, but that's what that remaining resonance structure was. OK. So now we need to go back up and look at um, VSCPR and molecular geometry and orbital hybridization. Um, and that will be most of what's left in this chapter. So let's take a look at, um, you all remember VSCPR to some extent? Good. Um, so electrons can be found generally in sigma bonds, pi bonds, and lone pairs. And the, what VSCPR is meant to do is to take those pairs of electrons that are in bonds and lone pairs about a central atom and figure out how to spread them as far apart as possible. The reason we would want to do that is pairs of electrons don't want to be near other pairs of electrons. They're going to be repelling one another. And so we want to figure out the optimal way to, to space those things apart about a central atom. Um, so let's take a look at CO2. If we draw the Lewis structure for CO2, It's going to look like this. Steric number. So what the steric number is, is counting up how many lone pairs and atoms, be very careful with my wording, how many lone pairs and atoms are attached to the central atom? How many lone pairs do I have on carbon? How many atoms are attached to carbon? Two. Two. So it's four bonds, but it's two atoms. I can't sever a sigma bond from its pi bond. They're, they go hand in hand. So I can't spread them out by way of VSCPR. I've got two atoms that I need to spread apart. So I have a steric number of two, and the most optimal way to get them as far apart from one another as possible is to have a linear geometry. Um, let's take a look at water. And when I draw a Lewis structure, I don't necessarily have to draw the correct geometry. Um, and in fact, I'm drawing purposely the incorrect geometry so we can figure out what it is. So let's take a look at water, oxygen with the, being the central atom. What is its steric number? Four. Yeah, great. It's bonded to two atoms and it has two lone pairs. So you've got a lone pair that's sitting in an orbital, you have another lone pair in another orbital, and then you have bonding orbitals for the hydrogen atom. So those are the four things that you're trying to spread apart. So that means that the steric number is four, and that starts us off with what we call in this column is the electron geometry. The electron geometry just meaning that we are counting we are considering both atoms and lone pairs in terms of how they're geometrically spaced apart from one another. So that starts water off as an electron geometry of tetrahedral. But off the top of your head, what do we know the shape of water is? What would we call the molecular geometry of water? Yeah. Right, it's bent. So what the molecular geometry does is, in a sense, ignores the lone pairs, not entirely, because if we entirely ignored the lone pairs, what would we say the geometry is? Linear. So we can't ignore them entirely, but what we do is we, we use everything to determine what the electron ge geometry is, and then we start off with that as a base point, and we just sort of then ignore the lone pairs. So if I were to take water, which starts off as an electron geometry of tetrahedral, and I just pretend those are not there because they're lone pairs, what's left is that same angle that was there originally, which is all approximately 109.5. Um, and I would get to, 
oops, a bent structure. It would be bent and the bond angles would be 109.5. Let's take a look at the molecule NH3. Here is its Lewis structure. What is its steric number? Four, great, it's got one low pair, three atoms, steric number is four. So that means it similarly starts off with an electron geometry of tetrahedral. If we want the molecular geometry, we start off with that base structure of tetrahedral and we ignore one of the groups to see what geometry is left over because one of those groups is a lone pair. So if I ignored this one, which I'm just doing for convenience of the, what the structure looks like, we end up with something that's considered to be trigonal pyramidal. So these bottom three sort of form like a pyramid that one with the bolded bond is meant to be coming out of the plane of the paper. The dash bond is meant to show it going into the plane of the paper. And then of course we still have the lone pairs here but the molecular geometry for that one then becomes um, trigonal pyramidal. Okay. Uh, let's see, let's do one that's trigonal planar. So if we look at this structure, the carbon atom, what is the steric number? Three, yeah, exactly. So it's got two bonds to oxygen, but we just wanna count how many atoms and lone pairs it's surrounded by. No lone pairs, three atoms. So that steric number is three. That says the electron geometry is trigonal planar. Because carbon has no lone pairs, its molecular geometry is also trigonal planar. So sometimes the molecular electric or electron geometry are the same, other times they're not. Um, if you had a trigonal planar where one of the, the things that was accounting for your steric number was um, a lone pair, then you would ignore one of those. And you would also arrive at a bent structure, similar to what we did for water. But what would the difference be? The angle, exactly. So tetrahedral starts off at 109.5. And so the bent structure is gonna have a 109.5 degree bond angle. What's the bond angle for this one? Yeah, exactly, it's 120. So you would arrive at a bent structure, but the bond angle would be 120. Okay, so the reason the geometry is important is because, well, for one, we should just know what the, the shapes of molecules actually look like. That'll become really important in the future. But it also can tell us something about the polarity of the molecule. We already talked about bond polarities. But more important than bond, I guess not more important, but equally important to whether a bond is polar is whether a molecule as a whole is polar. Um, and to have a polar molecule, we have to consider the overall geometry and then look at all the bond dipoles and see how they sum up and as to whether or not that's gonna give us a molecule which as a net result is a polar molecule. So let's use CO2 as our first example. We first have to answer the question, do I have polar bonds? Do I have polar bonds in CO2? Yes. yes. So the dipole goes towards each oxygen atom. Is the molecule polar? No, because the vectors of where those dipoles are pointing due to the linear geometry perfectly cancels out. Let's look at NH3. Did th does that have polar bonds? Yes? Yeah, so those go towards nitrogen. That's the more electronegative atom. Based on its geometry, does it have a net dipole? Yeah, so it's got that pyramidal structure. They're all pointed up towards the nitrogen. I'm going to get a net dipole that points up. So this is polar as a molecule, and this is a nonpolar molecule. So they both had polar bonds, um, but based on their three-dimensional geometry, only one of them ended up being a polar molecule. What if I have a molecule that has all nonpolar bonds? Can I find a geometry that would make it polar? 
No, there's just, I can't, do, if I don't have a dipole to draw, it doesn't matter what I do with it in three dimensional spaces. There's no dipoles to begin with. So it doesn't, they can't cancel each other or reinforce each other because they don't exist to begin with. So if you have all nonpolar bonds, the answer is pretty simple. It's a nonpolar molecule. Um, but if you have polar bonds, you do have to be mindful as to whether or not um, those dipoles cancel. Um, so just a few examples, carbon, carbon, two of the same atom, it's gotta be nonpolar bond. Carbon-oxygen, that one's a polar bond. Oxygen-hydrogen is polar. And just for your reference, to make it easy, carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. They're right at the cusp. Their electronegativity difference is 0.4, um, but they're considered to be nonpolar. OK, uh, let's see. So we already did this part above. Now we're going to talk about hybridization of orbitals. What I'm going to first start by doing is going down to this table. I'll explain why the correlation is what it is. But I also want to give you a way to simply determine what the hybridization is based on the steric number. Because now all of you know how to use the steric number um, to determine the electron geometry and the molecular geometry. You can translate that directly into a hybridization of the, the bonding orbitals. So I'm going to go through hybridization in just a minute. But right now, I just want to give you a quick way to get to the answer of what the hybridization is of the orbitals on a particular atom. So we determined for what, CO2 that the carbon atom had a steric number of 2. So anything with a steric number of 2, its hybridization of the orbitals are sp. Steric number of 3, sp2. Steric number of 4, sp3. And that's the simple way to correlate it. But now let me go up and actually talk about what hybridization of orbitals is and why the steric number ultimately ends up leading to this correlation. So we know that we have, let's take a molecule like methane. CH4. We know if we went through VSCPR, we would find that that has a steric number of four, so it's tetrahedral, and it has bond angles of 109.5. So if that carbon atom used its S and three pure P orbitals exactly as they are, we can't really reconcile what that geometry is. It doesn't make sense. Because those P orbitals, remember, they're in the PX, the PY, and the PZ. So those are all at 90 degrees from one another. So how do you arrive at a 109.5 equally spaced apart set of hydrogen atoms around that central carbon if you're using those exact orbitals? And so that's where the theory of, of hybridization of orbitals comes in, um, is that the only way to reconcile how we get them evenly spaced like this is to hybridize the orbitals, which is a very abstract thought to, to even really wrap your head around. Um, orbitals in general are very abstract, I think, and, and difficult to understand. But what we're going to do is we're going to take these four pure S and P orbitals, and we're going to mix them up and come out with four new orbitals. So what we do if we're hybridizing an S and 3P is we call its hybrid orbital SP3. And if we put four orbitals in, we need four orbitals out. So if we hybridize all four, we should get four equivalent sp3 hybridized orbitals. So why does methane or something like this with a steric number of four want to hybridize all four? Because it has four things around it, so it wants four equal orbitals. So it wants to hybridize all four, so it has four equal orbitals that can be evenly spaced. I'm going to make a stupid analogy um, to try and help you understand hybridization of orbitals. If you had a salt shaker, and three pepper shakers, like an S orbital and three P orbitals, and you emptied them all out into a bowl, what percentage of salt do we have in that bowl? And how much pepper? It sounds like a pretty tasty mixture, actually. I really like pepper. 
Not that anyone cares. Anyway, um, <laughs> so I've got this mixture of the salt and pepper in a 75%, 25% ratio, and I pour them back into the salt and pepper shakers. So now instead of one salt and three peppers, I have four pepper, sorry, four shakers that each contain 25% salt and 75% pepper. So sort of like what's happening with the orbital hybridization, we mix them together and we get four new orbitals out that look 25% like an S orbital and 75% like a P orbital. Super obvious, right? No, I know. But at least the salt and pepper helps tie it together a little bit. Um, oh, we're out of time already? It goes so fast. All right, we'll stop.